Hello everyone in Cardio Minds channel and welcome to the last 10 of video in the medications of heart failure and today we are speaking about prescribing the peculiar evaprazine. We remind ourselves with beta blockers for which we have given a dedicated video and we mentioned that beta blockers block the beta 1 receptors in the cardiac cell membrane resulting in negative chronotropic, bromotropic and enotropic effects but evaprazine has a separate mechanism because it acts on the funny channels responsible for sodium influx and partly potassium influx. When it blocks the funny channels, this results in slowing down the spontaneous diastolic depolarization in the SA nodes, and this results in reduction of the SA node rate, and so it controls the heart rate via the SA nodes rather than the AV nodes. So everprazine acts by a completely different mechanism from beta blockers. It acts on the channel rather than the receptors and it acts predominantly on the SA node resulting in negative chronotropic effect as its predominant pharmacological effect. We mentioned in the video pharmacotherapy for heart failure that everprazine has a class 2A recommendation in symptomatic heart failure patients with ejection fraction less than or equal 35% in sinus rhythm because it acts on the SA nodes and resting heart rate is still more than or equal 70 beats per minute despite treatment with the evidence-based dose of pizza blocker or the maximally tolerated dose by the patient plus ACE or ARNI plus MRA aiming to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death so we are speaking here about a mortality benefit plus the symptomatic benefit also, it has a class 2A recommendation in the same situation like symptomatic patients, ejection fraction less than or equal 35%, sinus rhythm and resting heart rate more than or equal 70, but here the patient is unable to tolerate the beta blocker or having contraindication for beta blocker, aiming also to reduce the risk of hospitalization and mortality, and here the patient should receive the evidence-based dose of ACE or ARNI and MRA. The second question in whom and when do we prescribe it? The main indication are in symptomatic heart failure patients are NIHA class 2 to 4 and they have ejection fraction less than or equal 35%, sinus rhythm, resting heart rate more than or equal 70 beats per minute despite optimal treatment and in particular an evidence dose of beta blocker. So we don't prescribe evaprazine before beta blocker. So remember that you need to do your best in order to start and up titrate the beta blocker to the recommended or maximally tolerated doses before considering everprazine. So always the rule is beta blockers at first, then add everprazine if heart rate is not controlled. What about the contraindications to everprazine? Of course, I will not prescribe everprazine in a patient with atrial fibrillation because here the SA node with either target action of the drug is suppressed by the atrial fibrillatory activity. In patient with severe hypotension, I am in absolute need for the compensatory tachycardia, so please don't abolish it. And patient with baseline heart rate less than 50, of course, you will not prescribe him a rate controlling medication. In patient with unstable cardiovascular condition like acute crying syndrome, stroke or TIA, there may be a relative contraindication for everprazine, not an absolute one, but you need to assess the hemodynamic status before prescribing it. Severe liver dysfunction or renal dysfunction like child C, chronic liver disease or creatinine clearance less than 15 ml per minute, in this case there may be a risk for increased serum level of everprazine resulting in toxicity. In pregnant or breastfeeding females, there is no enough evidence on the safety of everprazine and a patient with known allergic reaction or any adverse reaction to everprazine per se. There are some situations in which you need to be cautious when you prescribe everprazine. Like patients with severe heart failure NIHA class 4, in this case you may need to add everprazine to control the heart rate because you are unable to prescribe beta blockers due to the decompensated status. But be cautious about the hemodynamics because if this heart rate is a compensatory mechanism, this may result in hemodynamic compromise. 
in patients with current or recent exacerbation of heart failure, like recent hospitalization with acute heart failure. In this case, be cautious also regarding the hemodynamics before you start evaprazine. In patients with resting heart rate less than 50 during treatment with evaprazine. So this is a pharmacological effect, not the baseline heart rate. We are going to discuss what to do in this situation. In patients with moderate liver dysfunction like child B, in this case, you need to follow up the heart rate to guard against increased serum level resulting in life-threatening bradycardia. And in patients with chronic retinal disease, including retinitis pigmentosa, we need to check with the patient regarding any luminous phenomena resulting from the medication because on those patients, there may be a slightly increased incidence of this side effect. There are also some drug interactions that you need to look out with evaprazine due to the risk of inducing significant bradycardia, like verapamil and diltiazem, which are of course contraindicated in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but in other situations in which you can prescribe non-DHP calcium channel blockers, please don't add upon them evaprazine because they may interfere with its elimination. Also, digoxin and amiodarone represent a risk of inducing significant bradycardia with everpedine due to the added risk of negative chronotropic and dromotropic effects. And there are some medications that are considered strong inhibitors of the isoenzyme cytochrome, which is responsible for the elimination of everpedine, like antifungal azoles, macrolides antibiotics like azithromycin and clarithromycin, and the HIV protease inhibitors. The third question, which and what dose? The starting dose is 5 mg twice per day, reaching a target of 7.5. But remember that in elderly patients more than 75 year old, you may need to start with a lower dose of 2.5 twice per day. And always advise the patient to take the everpedine tablet with meals because this increases the bioavailability and the absorption of the medication. Then what is the situation in which we are going to prescribe everpedine? In stable heart failure patient in outpatient setting and also in patient hospitalized with worsening heart failure but after stabilizing the patient, relieving congestion and if possible restoring avolemia and better to be before discharge. And now with the precautions regarding how to use everpedine. Always start with a low dose like 5 mg or sometimes 2.5 mg as we have spoken shortly and increase the dose at two week intervals or sometimes a slower up titration in some fragile patients. Aim for the target dose or the highest tolerated dose as much as you can. If the resting heart rate is between 50 to 60 p per minute, keep the current dose of evaprodine and don't push it. Always monitor the heart rate blood pressure and clinical status in patients receiving everpedine and the specialist heart failure nurse as we have spoken before may assist the patient regarding the medication and how to monitor his heart rate and up titrate his dose. And now with some clinical problems that may face us in patients taking everpedine and how to solve them. If the heart rate get below 50 beat per minute. In this case, you need to have an ECG in order to exclude other significant prediarrhythmias apart from just sinus bradycardia. Review the need for other rate controlling medications that are taken like digoxin or amiodrone. In this case, you can stop them before stopping everpredine and review the need for other medications that may be interfering with the everpredine liver metabolism and then consider the screening for the secondary causes for prediarrhythmia like hypothyroidism or sometimes hyperkalemia. But if the patient developed high grades or even complete AV block after taking everpredine, of course, stop everpredine. Because as we mentioned, yes, everpredine acts on the SA node, but there are some case reports about AV block with temporal correlation with the everpredine intake. This may be explained by the presence of funny channels in the AV node on which the everpredine acts or another action that we don't really understand produced by everpredine, but the fact that there are some case reports of iatrogenic AV block occurring after starting everpredine. So in this case, you need to stop the everpredine because mostly it is the offending medication. Also, if the patient developed persistent atrial fibrillation during everpredine, therapy, so we are speaking about new onset atrial fibrillation developing after the start 
of evaporazine also you need to stop the medication because there is some evidence linking evaporazine to development of new onset atrial fibrillation so in this case it may be the offending medication as well one of the famous side effects of evaporazine are the luminous visual phenomena which are something like flashes of light that the patients feel after starting evaporazine resulting from its pharmacological effect on the retina they are usually transient and disappear after the first few months of treatment and you need to reassure your patients that they are not associated with any retinal dysfunction or affecting the vision. But in some cases, they are irritating and causing patients discomfort. And in this case, you may need to stop evaporazine. But after discussing the benefits and risk of the medication with the patient in order to decide whether we can continue and adapt to this side effect, or if they are very irritating, I may need to stop evaporazine and search for an alternative. Some patients may have glucose or lactose intolerance, which is either a genetic condition or sometimes acquired after severe gastroenteritis. What matters with this condition is that the evaporidine tablet has the glucose or sometimes lactose as an essential component as an excipient. So if the patient reported symptoms of GIT intolerance after starting evaporidine, you may need to stop evaporidine or check with the company if there is another form of the tablet that does not contain these excipients causing GIT upset. And finally, with the advice that we are going to give to our patients, we need to explain the expected benefits and tell the patient that the improvement may take few weeks to few months. Encourage your patient to measure and record his or her pulse regularly in order to monitor the medication effect. Advise the patient to report principal adverse effect caused by evaporazine like dyspnea or fatigue dizziness or syncope due to bradycardia and luminous visual phenomena. So our take home message from this video today is that avaprodine acts as a substitute or add on beta blocker therapy to achieve optimal rate control. It is not the first choice before beta blockers and the risk of both sinus node dysfunction and AV block is high with avaprodine, especially with concomitant rate controlling medications that's why you need to educate your patient to monitor his heart rate to take the appropriate action in case of bradycardia thank you very much for watching this video and next week we are going back to the guidelines of heart failure to discuss the non-pharmacological treatment